Hi friends, my name is Host Eric. I'm the host of Talking with Famous People. And this video is about T-Jump, but also about argumentation, rhetoric, public policy, stuff like that in general. So T-Jump is by far not the only Dunning-Kruger example in the debate part of YouTube. The people who do de debate stuff on YouTube, by and large, have no concept whatsoever about logic, rhetoric, debate, or anything like that. As a professional debate coach for many years, and a former policy debater in high school, I can tell you with no uncertain terms that the only way to meaningfully debate a topic that engages it intellectually is to have a structured formal debate where you have a clear resolution, one person's aff, one person's neg, they both take turns giving speeches, they both take turns giving rebuttals, and they have a question and answer period, one, each, one person being questioned, each, they each get a turn of being the questioner. You've got to have at least that to have a meaningful debate about anything. So, when I went on to T-Jump, I was anticipating being interviewed about my debate coaching experience. Um, what I discovered fairly much right away is that he has no debate experience. He doesn't know anything at all about debate. He also has aspirations to become president. And his policy notions are incredibly bad. So, for example, he thinks we should fund the IRS more so they can go after rich people. Well, the problem is this. The rich people are the ones who are engaging the most with the IRS anyway. They've gone to their lawyers, their tax lawyers, and they've exploited the nature of the tax code so that they're not paying taxes. The IRS can't enforce tax code that doesn't exist they can't bust people for successfully using the tax code to not pay taxes. They can't act against what the tax code says. It's insane to think that by giving the IRS more money, they would be able to go after more rich people and that, that would somehow be a good thing. Remember, wealth is generated when people do meaningful work in the world and currency is distributed and increased in the, into the economy in keeping, ideally, with the amount of new wealth in the world. We can make arguments about how that new currency ought to be distributed, and we certainly should. Uh, but it is insane to think that wealth is a problem in any way, right? Now, it may be the case that we have a great deal of wealth inequality, but what's of note is that those who are, who are in the bottom 99% or whatever are not poor compared to a measure of actual poverty right they're poor compared to the rich people so regardless the point is he's full of bad public policy notions when i talked to him about my homelessness idea i did so to demonstrate to him that there are plenty of times when you don't need past examples of something working to justify doing it which he rejected wholesale this notion so my example is homeless town because the Supreme Court has ruled, made a ruling indicating that municipalities cannot remove homeless people from public spaces unless they have housing to send them to. They've essentially issued an unfunded mandate to municipalities to build free housing for homeless people. The problem with that is it's unsustainable on so many levels. Municipalities that try to adhere to that unfunded mandate discovered that they attract ever more homeless people because that's where the services are now oh you can get a bed in this town and they build a bunch of homeless shelters and a bunch of homeless homes or whatever the second thing is for all the tax dollars going into building these free houses the people are not static things people are not they're a homeless person so now we're gonna give them a house that solves the problem it is not the way people work and as we all know when you don't pay for anything, you don't place much value in it. When you earn something and pay for it, you place value in it. What any sort of, let's build a bunch of homeless facilities thing in municipalities results in, invariably, is crime-riddled areas of, of slum, right? So the thing is, because the federal government has dictated to us the status quo regarding how we can deal with homelessness, it is best that we federalize the matter 
prevent municipalities from providing any services, centralize all service provision in one location. And because of the absence of services everywhere else, it's entirely voluntary. Homeless people will end up in homeless town though, because now since the municipalities have someplace to send them, namely federal homeless town, they can remove them from the public spaces. In the status quo, we've got this law that basically says homeless people can take ownership of a sidewalk by camping on it. Even though nobody should be able to take ownership of that sidewalk, it's everybody's sidewalk equally, right? So I've come up with a great solution to the West Coast especially problem that is consuming every city up and down the coast and destroying its livability entirely. I do not condemn homeless people at all. I am saying the contemporary status quo situation with this unfunded mandate from, from SCOTUS, Supreme Court, um, has put municipalities in a no-win situation, especially big cities. So I have a novel and untested solution for it. This gentleman, T-Jump, tried to indicate to me that we could partially test it. We could test it a little bit here and there to see before we commit to this idea. Of course, that's not how the legislature works. They don't pass laws to partially test things. They make decisions, pass a law, and move on to the next thing, right? Secondly, you can't partially test something, the engine of which relies upon the lack of availability of services elsewhere without actually getting rid of services elsewhere. You can't rely, you can't partially test something that says we're going to have a single centralized service provision spot that provides all the necessary services, health, homes, everything, right? Mental health, et cetera. Um, and it'll work beautifully to naturally, consensually draw the populations of homeless people that are currently uh, making major cities unlivable to a place where they'll actually receive consistent services, et cetera. And we can fund this by simply redirecting the money the municipalities are currently spending on this shit to uh, to this federal federally run thing. Um, or the federal government could just pay for it, you know? The thing is, I'm not in favor of big social programs. That's why instead of anchoring this into what we're going to do for homeless people, we anchor it to a location, right? We create a place that provides these services and as a consequence, the services get provided, the homeless people are centrally located and the cities become livable again. So this is a novel idea that regardless of whether or not you agree it's a good idea, you'd have to agree disproves the notion that we can only do things that have been tested and proven before. Because if we were to do that, no new ideas would ever be, be actually implemented. Because laws are written in such a way as to implement ideas, not to test them. That's not Congress's job. Right? Now, additionally, this gentleman, T-Jump, was indicating that uh, progressive taxation is, is good. Ignoring and not and or not getting the fact that, of course, any progressive taxation scheme invariably falls victim to the same systemic flaw. Namely, it requires you to means test people in order to determine how many taxes they pay. And, of course, people who are means tested, you're incentivizing poverty in that, in that fashion, right? So you want to earn less than Matt or else you go into a higher tax bracket. We should never have policies that incentivize poverty. And, you know, providing low income housing is another thing that incentivizes poverty. It happened in Seattle when they raised the, the, the minimum wage to $20 an hour. Um, people who were benefiting from, benefiting from federally funded low income housing stuff went to work and told them to cut their hours so that they could stay in their cheap housing, which also locks them into poverty long term. This is the problem with haphazard nonsense like T-Jump is spewing. If you're going to talk about public policy, you're talking about something important, something that matters. OK, I agree there is a problem in this country with the price of housing. It is too high. Rent is too high. 
home purchasing prices are too high for most anybody to even dream of buying a house unless they're super planning and well organized and want to get a 30 year mortgage or whatever, right? So there's no doubt that we need more housing. If, if we have a lot more housing, then the price of rent and or purchasing houses will go down invariably if the housing supply outstretches the demand, then prices will go down. The best solution, therefore, to overly expensive housing is to green light as many housing construction projects as you can. Of course, the same people who are frustrated about low income housing are often people who interfere with with individual developers making use of their the land they bought to to generate revenue streams for themselves, right? Because that's how progress works. You, you, you do something that's good for humanity and you get paid for it, right? The more useful the work I do, the more money I make. It's a hard and fast law. So the people who are useful to the most people, like Bill Gates or some super famous athlete who provides entertainment to millions of people, right? Those people make a lot of money accordingly. And people like me, well, I'm only useful to a small number of people. I've got a small audience. And what I'm saying isn't sought very much as a product to consume media-wise. Well, I don't make much money. I don't make really any money on YouTube, you know? So the thing is, that's fair, just right, and true. If I wanted to make money on YouTube, I would have to adapt and make different kinds of videos, be nicer. I'd have to be more likable. I'd have to be talking about juicy topics in the ways that people want them talked about, not in the ways that I talk about them, which is the correct way and what's true and correct and just and right, you know? This guy wants to start an atheist church to give away for low-income housing so that they can pool their money together to make low-income housing for people. The church would own this, presume, apartment complex they buy or maybe construct, you know? And then the question is, of course, okay, so are you only going to rent to poor people? And if so, are you going to means test them? And if you are in fact means testing people to say, okay, you qualify, you're poor enough, you can live in our house, then what happens when they cease being that poor? Do you want them to have upward mobility at all or not? Are you gonna kick them out when they become rich? What if they still wanna live there? Now you're not serving any poor people. Now, additionally, if you don't want a means test, which has a slew of harms implicit in it every single time, then you might very well end up renting your low income, low cost rooms or apartments or whatever to rich people who want a second pad and who just want to get out of the house sometimes and go down to their pad in the, in the ghetto. You know, it's, it's insane, this notion that we can as a group purchase this thing, provide people places to live at below market rate and not be overwhelmed by demand unless we eliminate most of the candidates. So you're talking about discriminatory housing practices implicitly. It's just discriminatory on, on wealth rather than on race or gender or something like that, right? <laughs> so, in other words, I might make more money than Joe, but I might be more broke than Joe, too. Cameron doesn't maybe bring in a shit ton of money, but he's super frugal with his money. He doesn't spend it unwisely ever. So, he's rolling good, you know, because he's really careful with his money. He would qualify for this free housing. And then, let's put me in a different situation, like before my dad died. I, you know, maybe a couple of years before my dad died, I was probably making more money than Cameron, but I was more broke than him because I'm not good at spending money wisely. So, so who get, should get this low income housing? These kind of questions are, are why they can't be answered meaningfully or why these kind of ideas always fail. Um, additionally, this gentleman seems to think there could be something that's too much wealth or that wealth is bad. Wealth is good. Everybody generates it every time they do useful work for another person. And they generate it as metaphysical aspects of it first, as 
quality of beholdens that then gets represented fungibly in currency. Okay, so what I want to say about debate, rhetoric, etc. is the following thing. If you don't know anything about public policy, stop positioning yourself as a pundit about public policy. Public policy is too important for people like T-Jump to play around talking about. That guy claims he wants to be president of the United States. But when I was crushing his ass and went out for a cigarette break, he ran away in terror, abruptly ending the stream, saying nothing about it. That's not president material, I'll tell you that. Um, because all I was doing was proving him wrong about his, his positions on evidence, on testing things partially, and on homelessness, on low-income housing, etc., and means-tested programs. All I was doing was crushing him on a few basic-level debate kind of topics, right? That, that you start with introducing to babies, basically. And that was enough to make him run in terror. Then he has no business being the leader of the free world, right? He's not, he's not strong enough to handle the heat of, that is required you to handle when you're president of the United States of America. So hopefully this experience has been humbling and informing to T-Jump. You need to know who you are and who you are not. You don't know anything about debate. You explicitly stated you prefer non formal or non-structured debates. You don't like structured debates means you don't want to intellectually engage about the topic at all. Because the only way to meaningfully engage about the topic is for both parties to say what they're going to say, then hear what the other party says, respond to it on point, and look at the arguments on the flow and see who is correct and who is not based on what those arguments say and based on responsiveness and et cetera, right? You're talking about legislation, but you don't even know how to calculate an impact calculus. Impact calculi link use probability, magnitude, and time frame. If you're going to try to justify things with predicted impacts, then you need to demonstrate the solvency of your perspective plan by pointing to the probability of those impacts. No, no impacts are certain, even if you test them partially, okay? Um, impacts are not a good way to understand whether things are correct, right, just, or true. Only whether they're effective according to your subjective desired outcome, right? So, um, so we when we advocate a course of action, such as homeless town, or such as fund the IRS more for no reason. Um, what we need to do if we want to convince people of it is number one, establish that it's not rights violating. In other words, that it's not illegitimate. And then number two, if you're gonna make an impact calculus, you need to establish that the impacts you're pointing to are likely, that they're um, significant, and that they'll happen relatively soon. Um, <sighs> And you additionally need to address harms. That is to say, and what bad impacts will my advocacy have in addition to the good impacts that I want? You need to present and address counter harms which may emerge. Your opponent is going to list as well harms called disadvantages when he lists them. And you need to respond to each of those disadvantages and include it in the impact calculus. If your response mitigates a disadvantage, for example, rather than uh, turns it, then that means you need to include those medicated impacts in your total impact calculus. You're not doing any serious work intellectually at all. You don't even know what I'm talking about when I'm saying this. So no T-Jump, you're no debater. You don't know anything about debate. You're definitely not qualified to be president. And you probably knew as soon as you got there, it was a mistake to talk to me. Sorry. Here you you stand hereby crushed beneath the boot of a real debater. Hope you learned something.